Shall we start? Okay. Um, yeah, welcome, uh, welcome back. So today I wanted to um, discuss uh, this morning and uh, this afternoon um, another uh, important problem in the context of, uh, of random, random matrices. So the statistics uh, of the largest uh, eigenvalue. So this is a class of, uh, of problems um, which uh, pertain to a branch of statistics that in general is called uh, extreme, extreme value theory. So before uh, tackling the uh, random matrix uh, case and explaining to you um, why this is uh, an interesting problem, so we will give some, some motivation and some, some applications. I wanted briefly, well, or maybe not so briefly, to, to go back to the case of independent random variables so that we, we can make the, the parallel between the uh, independent random variables case and the eigenvalues of random matrices, which, which we know are strongly correlated uh, random variables, okay? So we can appreciate um, the, the differences between the two cases. So, um, so one step, uh, one step back initially. Uh, I'll just describe the the problem in the in the simplest uh, possible terms. So uh, we have a collection of uh, random variables x1, xn. So these are random variables. which are IID, so independent and identically distributed, and they are taken from a common PDF, which we denote P of X. So P of X is the common PDF. We, we draw each of these variables uh, from, okay? And now we ask the, the question, what is the statistics of X Max. So x max is the largest element of this of this set. So what is the probability distribution of the largest element of, of this set? <coughs> so this is, a, this is a random variable which in general will have a certain distribution and how can we compute it starting with the only information we have we, which is this PDF here. Now the problem for independent and identically distributed random variables can be uh, tackled efficiently if we define an object which is Q, which we call Qn of x, so this will be the cumulative distribution function of the maximum. So this will be the probability that the largest element of the set is smaller or equal than x. Okay, so the probability that a random variable, the one that we are interested in, is smaller or equal than a certain value x. Now, if you think about it, the fact that the random variable x max, this one, is smaller or equal than x, occur, occurs with the same probability as the probability that all random variables are just smaller or equal than x. So this object here is exactly equal to the probability that x1 is smaller or equal than x, x2 is smaller or equal than x, xn is smaller or equal than x. Okay, so this, this obvious uh, equality now gives a way uh, forward because we can evaluate this, this object quite easily. Since the random variables are independent, this probability is simply the probability that the first random variable is smaller or equal than x times the probability that the second random variable is smaller or equal than x, and so on and so forth. So eventually, you can write that this object is just the power n of the probability that one of these random variables is smaller or equal than x. So it is the integral up to x of the PDF
do we all all agree on this? This is the this is the probability that one single random variable is smaller or equal than x, and we've got n of them, so we need to multiply them together. So this is the this object raised to the power n. Okay, excellent. So this this object here we can call it capital P of x. This is the cumulative distribution function of each individual random variables. Okay, now we are interested in what happens if we send n, n to infinity. And then the situation becomes, uh, in principle, quite trivial. But then it turns out that there is a very uh, deep and non-trivial result uh, here. So you see, if, if we don't do anything to x, and we just send naively n to infinity, so this object here, this uh, a function, but this object is between, by definition, 0 and 1 for all x. Okay? So if this object is strictly less than 1, and we send n to infinity, then what is the result of this limit? 0. So if this object is exactly equal to 1, and we send n to infinity, what is the result of this limit? Yeah. So if we send n to infinity naively without doing anything to the variable x, okay, then the result of this limit is trivial. It can only be 0 or 1. Okay? So in order to get a non-trivial limit when we send n to infinity, we need to do something else. So what we need to do, well, what we need to do is we need to send n to infinity and x to infinity in such a way that a certain combination of n and x is finite. So, more precisely, yeah. let's define a variable z, which we call x minus a n over b n. Okay, so a n and b n are cer certain constants that depend on n. And we define this new object z, okay? which means that x is equal to b n z plus a n. And now we substitute this x here as the argument of the cumulative distribution function of the maximum. So we obtain q n evaluated in a new scaling variable which is bnz plus an. And then we send n to infinity. So the question now is, can we find constants an and bn depending on, on n in such a way that this limit exists and it is a non-trivial function of z alone? <coughs> So we, we are scaling x, which is the only thing that we can play with here. We, scale, we are scaling x with n in such a way that we are trying to find something that is non-trivial, not just 0, 1, but, but a non-trivial function of z. Okay? So the, the main problem in this business is to find the constant a n and b n if they exist. Now, there is a quite uh, powerful and, uh, and very deep uh, result here. Can I raise here? So there is a very powerful result which goes under the name of uh, Fisher, Pippet, and Gniedenko theorem, which basically, in essence, say that for IID random variables, the scaling function
f of z, so this function here, can only be 1 of three different types. So, so there is a complete classification of the type of scaling functions that you can that you can obtain from this limiting limiting procedure. Okay? So the constants a n and b n will depend on the common probability distribution of each random variable. This function f of z is universal in the sense that it, it can only come in three different uh, species, okay, in three different categories. What are, what are these uh, three types? Well, what you need to define is basically the upper edge of the support of the PDF. So this is the supremum of the point for which p of x is smaller than, than 1 which basically means that this is the upper end point of the support of P of X. So, for example, if your PDF is uniform between 0 and 1, then this X star would be 1. If your PDF is an exponential, then this, this endpoint is at infinity, okay? So this is the, the, the upper endpoint. It is the largest value, if you want, that, your, that each of your random variables can take. Now, there are three cases then. So if x star is finite or infinite and p of x falls off faster than any power, for x to x star, then the limiting distribution Is anybody knows? No idea? No one has an idea? There's Matteo down there. Okay, the limiting distribution is Gumbel, which means that F of Z is the exponential of minus the exponential of minus z. Okay, so this needs to be a cumulative distribution because it is the limit of a cumulative distribution. Now, can you, can you see it? So if z is going to infinity, to plus infinity, can you see that this object goes to 1? And if z going to minus, minus infinity, this object is going to 0. Can you see it? So this is a proper cumulative distribution function. And it is the limiting distribution in the case, for example, if your PDF is a Gaussian or an exponential, then the probability distribution of the maximum will converge after being properly centered and scaled to a Gumbel distribution. Coffee? Yes? Yes. So we are now dealing with the Gamble distribution. Is it better? Okay. So I will give you an example later so that everything will, will be clarified. Okay? So, the only thing that, that I'm, I'm saying is just I'm trying to describe 
the three different types of the limiting distribution ac that, according to this, th this theorem, can be reached if you are considering the maximum of a set of independent and identically distributed random variables. So I'll just give you the names. The first one is Gamble. The second one is F, Frechet. The third class is called Weibull. Has any, has any of you ever heard of these three classes? No? Yeah. Okay, yeah? So if the external value of star is finite, we also want the limit to x star to be followed faster than... Yeah, so, so this is a bit of a sort of pathological case, but it is true that, that if, if the way your PDF approaches the finite point okay. is faster than any power, power law, then the limiting distribution is still gamble. Okay? So in it is not true that if your support is finite, uh, you always get a viable. Good. So the, the second class is if x star is infinite, and p of x falls off as a power law, so for example, p of x is x to the minus r plus 1 at infinity, then the limiting distribution is Frechet. So the formula is, let's call it F2 of Z. This one, let's call it F1 of Z, is exponential of minus 1 over Z to the gamma, if gamma is this object here. for z larger than 0 and 0 otherwise. So if, you're, if the PDF you, you sample your individual random variable from is a power law, then the statistics of the maximum, after being properly centered and scaled, converge to this, to this function. So both of these functions clearly are cumulative distribution functions because these are the limits of a cumulative distribution function. This means that for z, for the argument going to infinity, to plus infinity, it saturates to 1, and for the argument that goes to minus infinity, it saturates to 0. Yeah. So if, if the, exponent, the exponent here should be gamma plus 1, here you have an exponent gamma. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. It's not the same exponent. You need to... So exactly the cumulative distribution, when you integrate it, you get the Well, it, it comes out from it comes out from the calculation. It, it is this is this is not a, a trivial. This doesn't come out trivially from from the distribution of each individual random variable because you need to scale the argument and take the limit. Okay, for example, this this gamble here you cannot you cannot guess it from from the fact that each individual random variable is, for example, Gaussian. It is it is more complicated than that. But I will give you uh, an example. I'm just uh, giving you the classification now. So now, if x star is finite, and p of x goes as x star minus x to some power gamma minus 1, then the limiting distribution
is viable, which is defined as F3 of Z is exponential or minus Z to the gamma as Z smaller than, than zero and one Z is larger than zero. So, so, so far, uh, this is just the, the theory. Now, we can do an example just to understand how the, this whole business works in, in practice, okay? Can I raise on, on, this, on this side? Good. It's actually very, very simple if you think about it. So the result is non-trivial, but he, when, once you see an example, you will understand that, that the situation is quite, is quite simple. So what is, what is the, one of the simplest this PDF that you, can, that you can imagine? Uniform. Uniform, another one? Gaussian, another one? Sorry? Paolo, another one? Okay, I'll do the exponential. <laughs> Just because I, I've prepared it. So the exponential is quite, it's quite easy, right? So exponential PDF. So we take P of X as mu exponential minus mu X. So the support is x larger or equal than zero. So your PDF, you sample each of your random variable from, is like this. Okay? Now let us compute the uh, cumulative distribution function of the maximum of a set of exponential random variables. Okay, so we compute what the object Qn of x, which I told you is the integral between 0 up to x of mu exponential of minus mu x prime, dx prime, all raised to the power n. Agree? So this is exactly the formula I gave you before, specialized to the exponential case. Good. So if you perform this integration, what you get is 1 minus exponential of minus mu x all raised to the power n. So this is an exact result, which is valid for any finite n take two random variables, or 17, or 91, this is an exact result. You can simulate your, your system, even though you will need a lot of statistics, and, and find the perfect match between this formula and the histogram of the maximum of randomly generated exponential variables. Now, we want to take the larger limit of this object. What, what can we do? We can first rewrite this object as exponential of n times the logarithm of 1 minus e to the minus mu x. Okay? So I'm just, th just taking the exponential and the log. I haven't done anything fancy, except that I have destroyed the mark. Good. I would love to repay this. Excellent. So now, as x going to infinity, we can expand this logarithm. 
So what is the expansion of this logarithm as x go, goes to infinity? This, this bit becomes small. So what is the expansion of log of 1 minus something small? Wait. The logarithm of 1 minus epsilon. For epsilon going to 0? OK. So logarithm of 1 minus epsilon as epsilon goes to 0 goes as? Minus epsilon, right? Correct? Good. So if we apply this here, we get that this object is approximately exponential of minus n exponential of minus mu x. Right? Because the epsilon is this. Good, which we can rewrite this, this n, we can bring it to an exponential form. So we can write this as exponential of minus exponential of minus mu x minus log n. So I'm just rewriting this exponential, this n as exponential of log n. Hello, n is exponential of log n. OK. So now we have this, this expression here. Do you recognize anything here? Exponential of minus exponential of minus something. Gamble. So here is where Gamble is coming, is cropping up, right? So if we define this object as our z, as our scaling variable, z equal mu x minus log n. So if we keep this object fixed as we send n and n, n x to infinity, then this object converges to a Gamble distribution with parameters a n and b n, which are simpler. So a n here is log n over mu, and b n is 1 over mu. Just compare this definition with the one we gave before in terms of a n and b n. So, the precise statement is that the limit n to infinity of qn evaluated at the argument x, which is z plus log n divided by mu, is equal to exponential of minus exponential of minus z. That's, that's the precise statement for exponential distribution. Okay? You see that this object only depends on z. It is a non-trivial function, so it is not just a 0, 1. And it is due to the fact that you are sending n to infinity not just here, but also inside the argument of your function in the appropriate way. So if you, if you choose, if you pick different values of a n and b n, you might not get anything like this, you might still get a trivial limit, either 0 or 1. Is that clear? Now, the, the, the power of, of this theorem is that this, this type of limits, the, the right-hand side, is universal for a very large class of distributions. So if, if instead of picking an exponential, we picked a Gaussian or a stretched exponential PDF, we would still get this universal function on the right-hand side, provided we pick a n and b n appropriately. So a n and b n are non-universal. Non they, they change from one PDF to the other. But the right-hand side, the limiting distribution, is universal. It's one of these three types. 
questions. So we have a complete classification of the maximum, or the, distribu the limiting distribution of the maximum for IAD random variables, which is a quite powerful result, okay? So from now on, uh, ignorance of any of these functions will be sanctioned, okay? So fr from now on, you don't have any excuses when you will find a Gamble distribution, a Frechet distribution, or a viable distribution. So these are the extreme value classes that you all need to, to know. You cannot have a career in theoretical physics without knowing these functions. I'm not sure if this is true, but let's pretend it is. Okay, Gamble, Frechet, Weibull. Extreme values. You, you should immediately connect those to this, to this class of problems. Good. Now, why is this all uh, relevant? So this, is, this was not about random matrices. We, we just uh, did a step back to recap what is the situation for IAD random variables. Now we would like to do the same, the same uh, approach for eigenvalues of random, random matrices. So to consider the largest eigenvalue, for example, of, let's say, a Gaussian random matrix. What is the distribution of this, of this object? Now, it turns out that the situation is immediately much more complicated because the, the eigenvalues talk to each other. So the largest eigenvalue knows something about the second largest, the third largest, about even the smallest eigenvalue. They, it, there's a long range, all to all correlation. So all this classification goes into the, straight into the bin, and we need to, to start the calculations and the theory from scratch. Now, I wanted to give you some motivation why the, the problem of largest eigenvalue is interesting in, in physics, okay? Um, one of the, can I erase everything here? So one of the um, early example where this type of questions uh, came, came up is in uh, theoretical ecology. So I will describe briefly the, the first paper which connected theoretical ecology with properties of random, random matrices, okay? So this paper is a very, uh, very famous paper by Lord Robert May. So it is made in Nature um, 238 413, published in 1972. So this paper uh, is called Will a Large Complex System Be Stable? So if I'm not mistaken, uh, this paper should uh, be reproduced in, uh, um, in the handout. Yeah, so it's on page, uh, it is, it's on page 24 and 25. Actually, it is a two-page two -page paper, so it is reproduced in full. I invite you to, to read it, it's, it's very beautiful. It's just uh, two pages. It has thousands of, of citations. It is, uh, it is a good and pleasant read. Okay? Good. So the idea of this, uh, of this paper is, is quite simple. So suppose that you have a certain ecosystem composed of many, many species, lions, tigers, sharks, in the same ecosystem, I'm not sure, but okay. Let's pretend they, are, they live all in the same place. And let's, let's assume that this ecosystem at the beginning is non-interacting. So we have a non-interacting ecosystem. Which means you have lions there, tigers there, they don't talk, talk to each other, okay? They just live in the same area, but they are separate. 
and let's denote by rho i the population density of the ith species. Let us suppose that this ecosystem is non-interacting and stable. What does it mean it is stable? It means that if you each, uh, each species has an equilibrium value, which is obtained by the natural process of birth and, and death. And if you perform a small deviation, so if you perturb one species away from the equilibrium value, let's denote this uh, difference by xi, then there is a spontaneous tendency of each species to go back to this equilibrium value. Okay? Simply because uh, you know, every species is self-regulated and the, the rate of birth and, and, and death just balance off exactly. So the simplest model for this type of uh, decay to zero, so what, what, what we are saying is that xi should decay to zero as time uh, for, for large, for large, at large times. So the simplest model for this type of, of decay is a differential equation, a system of differential equations of the type dxi in dt equal to minus xi, right? So we are saying that the deviation from the equilibrium value decays exponentially to zero as time gets large. Is, is this clear? Of course, this, this, is just, this is just a model, but it makes sense that if you have an ecosystem that is non-interacting and stable, each deviation in individually for each species from the equilibrium value would spontaneously and fast decay to zero as time goes, goes on, goes by. OK, now the question is, what happens if, if we switch on interactions between the species? So if we, if we let lions and tigers uh, in interact. Now, uh, what, what May imagined is a random ecosystem so that the interactions between species do not have any specific, do not show any specific pattern. So how would you modify this, this law in the presence of, of interaction? Well, what, what May imagined, so interaction on. So what May imagined is that now this differential, this, this set of decoupled differential equations would be coupled in this way. The xi in dt is minus xi plus alpha summation j of a, let's, well, j can be different from i, or we can just set the self-interaction to zero. So May assumed that the model would get modified by adding some sort of average interaction strength between the species. which is modulated by a coupling matrix between species i and species j. And he assumed that in the most general setting, we can, we can treat this matrix A as a random, random matrix. So we can populate the entries of this matrix at random from a certain probability distribution. And then he asked the question, will this complex ecosystem complex and random ecosystem be stable. So in the limit t to infinity, will all the xi go to zero again? Of course, this, uh, you know, we have a system of differential equations in presence of randomness. So there is, there is a level of randomness here, because this is a random matrix. 
So, of course, it, it doesn't make sense. The, the question, will this complex ecosystem be stable, does not really make sense because we have uh, uh, an element of randomness in the game. So what we should ask, the question we should ask is, what is the probability that this ecosystem will be stable? So what is the probability that all the Xi's will go to zero, will decay to zero at large times? So if all the Xi's, which are the deviation from, of each species from its equilibrium value, go to zero at large times, then the ecosystem is, is stable. It means that even in presence of interactions, like pairwise interactions, the, the, the ecosystem is able to self-regulate itself and so you don't have extinctions, for example. So you don't have species that disappear from the ecosystem. Just to give you an example of instability. Is, is, it, is the setting sort of clear? This is just a model. We can, we can argue whether it is realistic or, or not. But we, we can just move from, from here and try to draw some, some conclusions. OK. So for example, uh, you can take A. This, this matrix A has a Gaussian uh, symmetric matrix, so like a real symmetric Gaussian matrix, so which belongs to which ensemble? What's the name of real symmetric Gaussian matrices? G? Yes, G-O-E, where O stands for orthogonal. Why? It is diagonalized by orthogonal transformations. Excellent. Good, we are doing well. OK, so how do I solve uh, this, this general problem even if, if A, even if, if A were um, a deterministic matrix, this is somehow a linear, linear system of coupled differential equations, so you know how to solve, to solve this, right? So what is the, what is the way to solve this, this system of, of differential, first order differential equations? Yeah? Exactly. So we have to, to write this as, as a matrix equation and then diagonalize the, the kernel matrix. Let me just do it quickly. So we introduce a vector of the uh, deviations of each species from its equilibrium uh, value. So we can uh, rewrite this set of differential equations in this form. Derivative with respect to time of the vector x is equal to what? Is equal to alpha A ma matrix minus the identity, because there is this uh, self-interaction term, applied to the vector x itself. Do we agree? So if you multiply this object by this, this vector, you exactly reproduce this component-wise differential equation. Excellent. Now what you do is you make an orthogonal transformation, which means that you diagonalize your matrix A. So you write A as, let's say, well, I called it S lambda S to the minus 1, where lambda is the diagonal matrix of eigenvalues which are real. And if you define a new vector y equal to s to the minus 1 applied to x, you can show that this matrix equation can be rewritten in terms of the vector y as d in dt of y is equal to alpha lambda minus the identity times y, applied to y. And now this is, this is nice because we have completely decoupled all the, all the equations. So this, this matrix is now diagonal, and so the ith 
component of the vector i only interacts with the ith component of the vector i. There is, there is no longer any, any cross, cross term. Do we agree? So this, this works also if a is not random. This is just the way we, we would solve the system of first, first order differential equations. Okay. Good. Now, when will this system of differential equation be stable? Yes, all the eigenvalues are negative, but the eigenvalues of what? The, the, the eigenvalues of A? Yes. So this, this object here, which is a diagonal matrix, let's call, let's call eigenvalues the entries that are on the diagonal of this matrix. Then this system of uh, ODEs will be stable if all of these objects on the diagonal are negative. Do we agree? OK. So the, the, the condition that we want the condition that we require is that alpha lambda i minus 1 should be smaller than 0 for all i, where lambda i are the eigenvalues, lambda i's are the eigenvalue of the interaction, of the original interaction matrix. Which means that lambda i should be smaller than 1 over alpha, let's call it w, for all i. Now, the fact that all the eigenvalues are smaller than a given barrier, than a, than a given threshold, is exactly a statement about the largest eigenvalue, right? So, so the original problem of, of May's uh, ecosystem has turned into a problem about the probability that the largest eigenvalue of a Gaussian matrix is smaller than a certain threshold. That's, that's how the, the connection uh, arises between, between the physical problem that we're dealing with and the statistics of the largest eigenvalue of, of a Gaussian matrix. So, so the, the probability of stability, so now what, okay, what May found is something quite striking, okay? So if we put W here, which is 1 over the interaction strength, and we put here the probability of stability, so that the ecosystem is stable, Okay. Now let's let's try to understand what what this this diagram is is telling us. W is one over the interaction strength between the species. Okay. So if alpha the interaction strength is turned off, we are back in the previous case of a system that is non-interacting and stable. Okay. So what is the probability that the ecosystem is stable in this region? One. Right. Because we know for sure that the ecosystem is stable. It is non-interacting. Then we turn on some interaction, but it, it is weak. Okay? So the interaction between the species, it is still weak. Now what happens is that in the limit n to infinity, the probability of stability is still 1. So it, it, it stays there for a while. So here we have that the probability that the ecosystem is stable is still equal to 1 in the strict limit n to infinity. So the probability is still 1. Now the interaction is getting stronger and stronger between the species while, while I move this way. Now what, what May found is that there is a critical value of the interaction strength 
after which, so to the left of which, this probability of stability drops suddenly to zero. So there, there is basically a sudden phase transition in which in the limit n to infinity, the probability of stability drops from one to zero. Okay? So an ecosystem that is almost surely stable, if the uh, web of interaction becomes sufficiently strong, will turn immediately, overnight, into a system that is almost surely unstable. So there is a sharp, there is a sharp phase transition So the, the precise statement is that if you take the limit n to infinity of the probability that the ecosystem is stable, so this is 1 if alpha is smaller than a certain critical value, or alternatively if w is larger than a certain critical value, and it is 0 if alpha is larger than a certain critical value. So, of course, this, uh, this uh, result sparked a lot of uh, interest and also a lot of uh, controversies. Um, now, this, this was just to give you some, some motivation on why, why it is interesting and, no, and often useful to study the statistics of the largest eigenvalue of, uh, of a Gaussian matrix. So we would like to know, we would like to understand this phase transition a bit, uh, a bit more. For example, <coughs> uh, well, I'll just, I'll just say this thing and then we can, uh, we can have a break. So. One, one may ask the question, okay, what happens if n, the number of species, is large but not strictly infinite? Okay? What happens if n is large but finite? Any, any idea, based on your uh, physical, physical intuition, what, what happens when you have a phase transition which can only happen strictly in the limit n to infinity, and you, you relax this, this condition? Yeah, so, so what, what you will have is that the sharp phase transition typically gets smooth, smoothed out and, and you get basically a smooth crossover between the two, the two regions, okay? So for, for large but finite n, this phase transition will be smoothed and you will get some sort of continuous distribution where the, this, this range, the range over which you have this, this crossover becomes sharp, becomes steeper and steeper as you increase, as you increase n. So this one, if you, as you increase n, you will get something like this, and then you will get something like this, and then at some point, boom, in the limit n to infinity, you get, you get this, 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 continuous, this continuous jump. Okay? So this means that if you plot the derivative of this object, so this is a cumulative distribution function, if you want, because it is the cumulative distribution function of the largest eigenvalue. So what happens if you plot the derivative of this object? What is the derivative of the cumulative distribution function? The probability, distribu the probability density function, right? So if we plot the derivative of this object, what you will get is typically that for large but finite n, you will get some sort of shape, shape like this, with a certain typical width here. And this typical width will basically shrink as you increase n, right? Because, because in, in, the, in the limit, this should become a very peaked, and in the limit, a delta function at, at the transition. Okay. So what is, what is the size of this, of this width? Can we estimate? the size of this typical, typical width as a function of n, well, it turns out that we can, and the order, the order of, this, of this width is, turns out to be n to the power minus 2 third. So I will try then later on to, to give you um, a heuristic explanation for why this, uh, this, this power minus 2 thirds should, should appear in, in the game, okay? 
So as you see, when you increase n, this becomes sharper and sharper. So it, it, the, the PDF becomes narrower and narrower, more peaked around the critical, the critical value. OK? Good. So um, now that I've sort of given you some, some uh, you know, motivation why the study of this type of problems is, might, be, might be interesting, we will try to, uh, in the next uh, part of the lecture, to give some more um, introductory statements on the distribution of the largest eigenvalue for Gaussian, for Gaussian matrices. Right? And then we will continue this, this afternoon. There's, there's a, lot, a lot to be said. OK? Let's come back in five minutes or I don't know. Um, ecosystem. Uh, so I gave you at the beginning of just just summarize. I gave you like a, a crash course on uh, extreme value uh, theory, like half an hour. Then we discussed the um, ecosystem problems, which is connected to the largest eigenvalue of uh, random matrices. Now I wanted to give you like another crash course on on large deviations. Now, so that we can uh, in the end combine all these these tools together to analyze the distribution of the largest eigenvalue properly uh, this, um, this afternoon, OK? So the crash course, uh, the, the reason I'm, I'm doing this is that because we will need extreme value theory, and we will need large deviation theory to understand the properties of, um, uh, of the, the largest eigenvalue, and also because this example that I'm, I'm giving you, I find it extremely instructive. So actually, I think I understood, even though I, I worked on large deviations for, for a lot of, for a long time, uh, I think I only understood it really when, when, I, when I was informed about this, this example. Okay? So I thought that it would be my third or fourth gift to you during these lectures to just tell you what, what I've learned from, from this example, which I find it very instructive. OK? So crash course. On large deviations. So the, uh, the example uh, from which everything uh, will become clear is a standard random walk in one dimension. OK? So a random walk in 1D. So you have a one-dimensional lattice with spacing uh, 1. And we have a walker that can hop to the right or to the left at each discrete time, time steps with probability p and with probability q equal to 1 minus, 1 minus p. OK? So if we denote by xn the position of the walker <coughs> at step n, This position of the walker at step n is given by the position of the walker at step n minus 1 plus a random variable, psi n. This random variable can take value plus 1 or minus 1 at each, at each time step with a certain probability. So the probability of psi n can be written as p delta of psi n minus 1. So with probability p, our random variable will take up the value plus 1, plus q, which means 1 minus p, delta of psi n plus 1. OK, so this is the, the standard recurrence equation for random walks in, in one dimension. The position of the worker times n is entirely determined by the position times n minus 1 plus a random variable, which can take value plus 1 or minus 1. Okay? This is, in essence, this is 
the uh, translation of the Markov property for random words. Yeah, regular lattice space, uh, like uh, the spacing is one, and I take discrete time. Okay, the evolution is, is in discrete time. Discrete space and discrete time in one dimension. Okay, now you, I'm sure you all know how to solve this, uh, this recurrence equation. We can iterate it down to the first the first step, so we obtain that the solution x n is given by the summation k1 to n of the noise, noise variables. Right? And then we can take from, from this uh, equation, we can, for example, obtain that the average position of the worker will be at time n, will be just the average of k1 to n of the noise variables. So this will be summation k1 to n of the average of psi k. So what is the average, what is the average of, of psi k? Zero. Well, zero, maybe not, right? Because if p if p is much larger than q, your, your worker tends to go much faster to the right, right? The modulus of k minus q. Yeah, yeah. Let's. But let's say that since q is, is 1 minus p, so we can, we can write that this object here, summation k 1 to n, is n, let's say, p minus q, assuming that p is larger than q. So we know that p plus q must be equal to 1 because of conservation of probability. At the same, at the same time, you can compute the variance, or let's say the second moment first. Well, second moment first, and minus, let's say, the square of the first, first moment. This is the variance of the position. So I'll give the result to you for p, q, n. This is a nice exercise if you have never seen it before. Okay, now we have a result about the mean position of the worker at time, t, at time n and the variance. So maybe, since the variance is finite, what is the tool that we can, that we can use to approximate the probability distribution of the position for large times? Yeah. So what is the what is the name of the mathematical tool that we need to apply to approximate the probability distribution of the position of the worker at time n? I only computed I only computed the mean and the variance and I obtained that the variance is finite. Yeah? Yeah. So we can we can apply the central limit theorem. to state that the probability of the position of the worker being xn at time n can be approximated for large n as 1 over root 2 pi times the variance, which is 4 pqn, times the exponential of minus 1 over 8 pqn, xn minus p minus q n square.
So the, the position of the, of the worker at time n for n large will be peaked around p minus q n times n, which is the average. And it will have a distribution which, is, which has a Gaussian shape around this, this value with a variance that is this that we have computed. OK? Clearly, if p and q are equal, so 1 half probability to the right, 1 half jumping to, to the left, then the average position will be around 0 with clearly fluctuations that are described by a Gaussian PDF. Okay, this is all standard, standard stuff. So another way to rewrite this uh, in a more uh, mathematician-friendly way to write the statement of the um, central limit theorem, so probabilists would prefer to write this in this form. So Xn, we can write it as P minus Qn plus root 4 p q n times chi, where chi is a random variable, and xn clearly is a random variable. So we say that this random variable will be equal to the mean plus standard deviation times another random variable. And so the statement will be that p of k for large n will be a standard Gaussian as n goes to infinity. This is just a restatement of the central of the central limit theorem in in a form that is uh, that probabilists would find more more appealing. So I just redefine a, a new random variable which is related to the first random variable in this way. And the PDF of this new random variable will be just a standard Gaussian. OK. Good. And now things become quite uh, interesting, right? We want to understand large deviations. OK. So xn the position of the walker at time n. What is the largest value that xn can take? Sorry? No, what is the, what is the largest possible value that xn can take? n. Yes, n, right? Because, because although it is unlikely, I can, in principle, make n steps to the, to the right. So in, 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 n, in n time steps, of course, if I start from the origin, in, in n steps, the, the farthest position to the right that I can, in principle, reach is n. Correct? So this is the farthest position that I can, that I can reach on the right. What is the farthest position on the left? Minus n, right? Good. So here we have the uh, origin. And here I'm slotting the probability of xn n. So we know that here we will have some p minus q times n value. And here, this PDF will look like a Gaussian <coughs> You know, peaked, peaked around this average value and with a certain width, which is the standard deviation that we have here. Do we agree on this? Okay, excellent. But what is the property of the Gaussian PDF? What is the support of the Gaussian PDF? Oh. So what is the support of a Gaussian PDF? What, what are the values over which a Gaussian PDF is defined? The real axis, right? So in principle, although the probability decays very, very fast, you have non-zero probability for any value 
on the real axis. Okay? So if we interpret this relation correctly, and this is a Gaussian, then we run into a problem, right? Because if we try to extend this PDF, this Gaussian PDF, all the way you know, on, on the full real axis, we run into troubles, right? Because we know for a fact that the largest value that Xn can take is not infinity. It is n. So what are we doing here? You see what the, problem, what the problem is? We have a statement about the central limit theorem that tells us that the distribution in the larger limit is a Gaussian. But we know that our, that our random variable has a finite support up to n. Great, but there is a problem, because you can compute the probability that xn is equal to n exactly, right? OK, let's compute this. So what is the probability that xn is equal to n? P to the n, right? Because I need to, I need to take n steps to the right, each of which happens with probability p. p to the n, which I can write in exponential form as exponential of n log p. Right? Now, let's try to compute p xn equal to n from the central limit theorem. Okay, So I'm computing it in two ways. This is the exact result. This is valid for any n and also in the larger limit, right? It is an exact result. But now, if I, if I replace xn with n here, what do I get? I get 1 over root 2 pi 4 pqn exponential of minus 1 over 8 pqn times n minus p minus qn square. Right? And if I simplify, you see what I'm doing? So I'm trying to compute the probability that xn takes the value n in two different ways. By using the exact result, which is p to the n, and by using the central limit theorem approximation. So I'm just replacing xn with n here. Sorry? So actually, you can't even get the value bigger than 1. Absolutely. Absolutely. But the, but the decay, so what, what you should do is, I mean, if you take the logarithm of this probability, the logarithm of this probability density, and you divide it by n, and then you send limit n to infinity, here you obtain a very specific result. OK? If you are doing the same operation on at the level of the probability density, you get a different result. OK? So it means that this object here, on a logarithmic scale, is different in the two cases. So it means that the shape of the probability density in the limit n to infinity is only accurate up to a certain distance from the average. And this distance is precisely given by this number here. It means that when you, extend, when you try to extend the logarithm of this probability density away from the region where the average and plus or minus the standard deviation, you run into trouble. Because the, the logarithm of the two, of the uh, Gaussian probability distribution and the uh, exact result would not match, would only match around 
the mean, but not around the edges. So the only point that I'm trying to make is that we need to be careful in using the central limit theorem away from the mean. Because the central limit theorem is not able to describe events that happens far away from the mean. Okay? So, what happens here is that there will be a function that interpolates smoothly between the average and the extreme events. And this function that interpolates smoothly between the, the average and the tails has a name, which is called large deviation or rate function. Do you know how to compute the large deviation or the rate function for this problem? Well, we can compute it quite easily by simply using one trick. Uh, let me write here. So let's write an exact expression for the probability that xn, the probability that the position is equal to xn at times n, okay? This is a well-defined distribution. It is a discrete distribution. There is no problem it, at finite n, right? There is no, no approximation. So how can we, we, we write an exact expression for this object? Do you know how to, to write it? We computed the average, we computed the variance, but how can we compute the full distribution? Yes, but that's, that's, compl you know, that's complicated. So like a more, more direct, like combinatorial way of doing it. Yeah. So suppose that we have, we take n plus steps to the right, and n minus steps to the left. Okay? So can we write equations for n plus and n minus? Probably yes, right? Because n plus minus n minus is equal to what? The, the number of steps I, I made to the, to the right, sorry? The total? N, n is, is a time, time variable, so, so n can only increase. But if I made 10 steps to the right and five steps to the, to the left, in the end, where do I do it? Yeah, so that's the final position that I reached, right? Is it clear? I moved 10 steps to the right, five steps to the left, in the end, I am in the position five, correct? This is what you wanted to say? Okay. Okay. And what is instead n plus plus n minus? n, the total number of steps, right? So what, what I can do here is to write that this probability will be p raised to the power n plus, right? Because with probability p, I'm taking a step to the, to the right, and all the steps are independent times q raised to the power n minus. And then I will need to add here what? You know, I will need to add there a combinatorial factor, right? Because, because I can take the steps in any given, in any, in any order, you know, and still get to the same position. Yeah, so you will, you will have probably n over n plus, okay? Because you will have that this will, will give you the number of uh, possibilities of, of uh, performing n plus steps to the, to the right out of a string of n, n total steps. Okay, now using this, uh, this exact expression, which is valid for any finite, finite n, and using these two equations, it is up to you to obtain a result 
for a certain object. I'm telling you what this object is. So you combine this object and, and these this two equations. And you show, so the exercise is to show that P of xn n for large n goes as, so the leading term for large n of this object is exponential of minus n phi of x, where small x is given by xn over n. So all you have to do is to replace n plus and n minus with the solution of this, uh, of this object, and then approximate the binomial for large n. How do you approximate the binomial for large n? What's the name, what, what's the name of the guy? Sorry? Yeah. Uh, what, what I'm saying is that you will have, you will have a, you know, you will write it as a ratio of factorials, and then you will need to expand factorials for large n, which you do with? Exactly, yes. So you will find that the leading, leading term of, of this probability has this exponential form, exponential of minus n into a function of x that you need to determine. Now, the solution for this function of x is very interesting. So we started with an exact, with an exact result, and we are taking the limit n to infinity. Okay? And now, the, the function phi of x that you need to prove will be 1 plus x over 2. So please do this exercise because it's very instructive. Logarithm of 1 plus x over 2p plus 1 minus x over 2 log... 1 minus x over 2q. So this will be this this will be the, the result of this of this operation. You start from a finite n formula. So everything here is, is well defined, and you just take the, the larger n limit, and the leading term has this exponential form with a function that has this exp explicit expression. Have you ever seen this function before? Well, I want an answer. Either you have seen it or not. Yes, you've seen it. How many people have, have seen this? have seen this before? So why is this function important? Why, why is this function the central object of, of the theory? Let's, let's compute what happens when xn is equal to n. So the problem that we had before. When xn goes to n, so we are in the ex extreme situation where you've taken most or all your steps to the right, the small x becomes equal to 1, right? So what happens to phi when x is equal to 1? So this, this one will be, will be killed in the limit. So if you technically you send x to 1, okay? And here you will have log of 1 over p from, from here which is equal to minus log p. And minus log p is precisely <coughs> the object that we had here. It, it came from an exact calculation for finite, for finite n. So this function reproduces the exact leading behavior of this probability for the extreme event where you've taken all your steps to the right or for that matters, all your steps to the to the left. So if you if you plot this function, this function will have a domain between zero and one, and here it will go to the function log 
log p. Here it will go somewhere, somewhere else. It will go probably to log q. So minus log p minus log q. And then it will be like this. So we have seen that this, this function reproduces correctly what happens to your probability in the extreme case where you have taken all your steps to the right. But also, it will give you a lot of information around this minimum here. So if you expand this function around its, its minimum, you will find that your function phi of x around here goes as 1 over 8 pq x minus p minus q square. So, so this function here has a quadratic behavior around its minimum. And this quadratic behavior is very interesting. You see, what is this, the center of the parabola? It's p minus q. which is exactly the imbalance between the, the right and left probabilities. Now, if you, if you replace this quadratic behavior into here, what do you get? Yeah, a Gaussian with which mean and which variance? So, P of xn, n will go as exponential minus n into this this function here, which is 1 over 8 p q x, small x, but small x was xn over n. So xn over n minus p minus q all square. And if you, if you rearrange uh, these terms by pulling a factor of n here outside. This guy here is equal to exponential minus 1 over 8 p q n x n minus n p minus q square, which is, which is precise, precisely the peak of the Gaussian PDF that we obtained from the central limit theorem with the correct mean and the correct variance. So this function here, which is called the large deviation function or rate function, is an amazing, is an amazing object. It is the central object of the theory. Why? Because it reproduces the central limit theorem, but also it reproduces the extreme event. So it, with one single function, you, you are matching the regime close to the mean, which is described by the central limit theorem on, on, a scale, on the scale of the standard deviation, but also the extreme events where, for example, your walker has taken all the steps to the right or all the steps to the, to the left, all in a single, in a single function. Okay. So, unfortunately, in, in most of the... Uh, probability courses at the undergraduate levels, there is a, a large emphasis on the central limit theorem, but not so much emphasis on large deviations, where actually, from large deviations, you can somehow reconstruct the central limit theorem, but not the other way around. So if you, if you only know about the central limit theorem, you, you, cannot, you cannot argue what's happening very far away from, from the mean. So for, for deviations that are much larger, than the standard than the standard deviation. Okay. So what I what I wanted to argue is that the rate function, the large deviation functions, are the central should be the central objects that we should aim aim for, because rate functions from rate functions we can reconstruct the central limit theorem, but also have information about extreme events that are not covered by it. Okay. So. Um, what time is it? Ten forty nine.
which is the end, right? Okay, excellent. I exactly did what I, what I planned to do. Um, so this afternoon, we are trying to combine extreme value statistics, large deviations, and I will try to give you an example of application of all this in a field that is uh, outside random matrices, just to, to make some sort of interesting connection between, between a random matrix problem and a combinatorial problem. problem. So I will show you some, some nice uh, slides as well. So see you at uh, 2.30, right? Okay.